The Brothers Karamazov, Epilogue, Subsection 3, Elyushaka's Funeral, The Speech by the Stone, page 975. He was indeed late. They had been waiting for him. They are talking about Alyosha. And even decided to bear the pretty little coffin, decorated with flowers, into the church without him. This was the coffin of the poor boy Ilyushenka. He had died two days after sentence was passed on Mitya. When he was still only at the front gate of the house, Alyosha was greeted by the cries of the boys, Ilyosha's companion, companions. They were all waiting for him impatiently and rejoiced that at last he had arrived. In all, there were about twelve, twelve of them, and they all had their satchels and shoulder-slung shoulder bags with them. Papa would cry, you must be with Papa. Ilyosha had made them promise before he died, and the boys had remembered this. At their head was Kolya Krasotkin. How glad I am you have arrived, Karamazov, he exclaimed, extend, extending his hand to Alyosha. Things are dreadful here. Truly, it is painful to see. Snegirov Snigir, is not drunk. We know for a fact that he has something. He, had, he has had nothing to drink today, but he seems to be drunk all the same. I am forever resolute, but this is dreadful. Karamazov, if I do not detain you, may I, in addition, put you to put you put to you one question before you go inside. What is it, Kolya? Alyosha said, pausing. Is your brother innocent or guilty? Was it he who killed your father, or, or was it the lackey? Whatever you say, so let it be. For four nights I have not slept for this idea. It was the lackey who did it, and my brother is innocent, Alyosha answered. And so say I, the boy Smirov suddenly shouted. So he's going. So he is going to ruin as an innocent victim for the truth and justice, Al Kolya exclaimed. Though he is ruined, he is happy. I am ready to envy him. What is this you are saying? How is it possible and why? Alyosha exclaimed, astonished. Oh, if only I, too, could serve some day sacrifice myself for truth and justice, Kolya said, Kolya said with some enthusiasm. But surely not in such a cause, not with such disgrace, such horror, Alyosha said. Of course, I should desire to die for, for all mankind, and as for disgrace, then it is all the same, for our names will perish. Your brother's your brother, I respect. And so do I, suddenly, now quite unexpectedly, shouted from the crowd that same boy who had once declared that he knew who had founded Troy, and having shouted precisely as he had done that day, that other day other day, blushed to his ears, like a like a peony, P E O N Y. Alyosha entered the room. In a blue coffin decorated with white ruche, his little hands folded together and his little eyes closed lay at Ilyusha. The features of his wasted face had hardly altered at all, and strange to say, there was almost no smell from the, from the corpse. The expression on his face was serious, and he looked as though he were reflecting about something. Especially beautiful were his hands, which were folded crosswise, as though they had been sculpted out of marble. Flowers had been put in his hands and indeed the whole coffin had already been decorated, both on the inside and on the outside, with flowers that had been sent at break off day by Lisa Kokakova. But flowers had not arrived from Katerina Ivanovna, and when Alyosha opened the door, the second-grade captain with a bunch of flowers in his quivering hands was in the process of scattering them, too, over his dear boy. He hardly glanced at the entering Alyosha, and was unwilling to look at anyone else either, not even, in, not even his weeping, crazy wife, his little mother, who kept endeavouring to raise herself on her disabled legs and take a closer look at her dead boy. Ninochka had, on the other hand, been raised from her chair by the children, and they had moved her right up to the coffin. She sat pressing her head against it, and was also, no doubt, quietly weeping. Snegiryov's S-N-E-G-I-R-Y-O-V So, Snegiry... Snaggy Ryoff's face had a look that was animated but somehow but somehow confused and at the same time desperate. In his gestures in his gestures, in the words that escaped from him, there was something half insane. My fellow, my dear fellow, he exclaimed he kept exclaiming every moment, looking at Alyosha. When I, looking at Ilyusha. When Ilyusha had been alive he had a habit he had had a habit of saying to him affectionately my fellow, my dear fellow, little father, give some flowers too. Take one from his little hand. Look, there, that white one, and give it to me. And give it me, the crazy little mother begged, sobbing. Either, 
either it was that she had taken a fancy to the small white rose that was in Ilyusha's hands, or that she had wanted to take a flower from his hands in memory, but she began to fairly throw herself about, stretching her arms out for the flower. To no one I will give them, to no one I will give them, Snegiryov Snegiri Snegiri exclaimed hard-heartedly. The flowers are his, not yours, all of it is his, and, not, and none of it is yours. Papa, give Mama a flower, Ninochka said, suddenly raising her face that was moist with tears. Certainly not, not to her, least of all. She did not love him. She took the little cannon away from him that day, and he gave it, gave it to his, gave it to her. The second great captain suddenly sobbed loudly at this recollection of how Ilyusha had yielded his cannon to his Mama. The poor crazy woman fairly dissolved in quite quiet weeping, covering her face with her hands. The boys, seeing at last that the father would not release the coffin from his charge, even though it was now time that it be born, suddenly surrounded the coffin in a tight mass and began to raise it up. I do not want to bury him in the cemetery, Snegiryov suddenly cried out, but the stone I will, by the stone I will bury him, by our old stone. Those were Ilyusha's instructions. I will not allow you to take him away. Even earlier, for this whole three days, he had been saying that he was going to bury him by the stone. But Alyosha, Krasotkin, the landlady, her sister, and all the boys had taken a different view. Would you ever believe the ideas he his dreamed up to bury his son by, this, by some hidden stone as though he hanged himself? The old landlady said severely. There's land there in the cemetery with a cross. They will pray for him there. He'll be able to hear the singing from the church, and the deacon rin, rin, reads so clear and literate that it will all reach his ears every time, just as though it were being read over his little grave. At last, the second great captain waved his hands, as if were saying, Take him wherever you like. The children raised the coffin, but as they bore it past the mother, they paused before her for a moment and lowered it so that she might say farewell to, to Ilyusha. But when she caught sight of the dear little face, close at hand, which all the three days she had beheld only from a certain distance, she suddenly started to shake all over and began to jerk her grey-haired head hysterically this way and that way over the coffin. Mama, give him the sign of the cross, give him blessing, kiss him, Ninochka cried out to her. But like an automaton, she kept jerking her head and speeches, speechlessly with a face that was distorted by burning grief, suddenly began to beat her breast with her fists. The coffin was born further. When it was born past her, Ninochka, for the, for the last time, pressed her lips to the mouth of her deceased brother. Alyosha, on his way out of the house, was about to address the landlady with a request that she attend to those who would remain behind, but the landlady did not even let him finish. Stands to reason, I'll stay with them. We're Christians, too. As she said this, the old woman wept. They had not far to bear him to the church, some three hundred paces no more. The day was clear and still. There was a frost, but not much of one. The sound of the church bells was still booming out. Snegiri, Snegiriyov, bustled, bustling and confused, ran along behind the coffin in his wretched old short coat that was almost of summer lightness, his head uncovered and the old, broad-brimmed, soft hat in his hands. He was in a kind of irresolvable anxiety, and would now suddenly stretch out his hand in order to support the head of the coffin, thereby merely getting in the way of the bearers, now run into the side and see if he could not fit himself in there. One of the flowers fell on the snow, and he fairly hurled himself to retrieve it, and as though God only knew what, deep, what depended on that flower. And about the cross, we've forgotten the cross, he suddenly exclaimed in, the, in terrible alarm. The boys at once reminded him he had taken a crust of bread earlier that day and that it was in his pocket. In an instant, he jerked it out of, the, of his pocket and, having ascertained that it was there, regained his composure. It's, Ilyu, it's, Ilyu, it's Ilyushenka's instructions. Ilyushenka's, he at once explained to Alyosha. He was lying in bed one night, and I was sitting beside him, and he suddenly told me, Papa, when my grave is filled in, crumble a crust of, of bread on, on it so that the little sparrows will come and I will hear them and will feel happy that I am not lying there alone. That is very good, said Alyosha. You must take bread there often. Every day, every day, the second great captain babbled, as if he thought, as if he had thoroughly brightened up. They arrived at last in the church and put the coffin down in its midst. 
All the boys stood around in a circle and continued to stand fast decorously throughout the entire service. The church was an ancient one and rather poor. Many of the icons had no mountings at all, but in such churches one somehow prays better. As the liturgy was sung, Snergeryov appeared to grow a little hushed, though from time to time he broke forth in him the same unconscious and seemingly confused anxiety. Now he would approach the, co approach the coffin in order to adjust the pall, the pal, the pall, P-A-L-L, -L, the fillet, for at once, when a candle fell out of the candle holder, he suddenly threw himself to replace it, fussing it, fussing over it for a dreadfully long time. After that, he regained his composure and stood meekly by the head of the coffin with a dully anxious and seem seemingly bewildered face. After the reading of the epistle, he suddenly whispered to Alyosha, who was standing beside him, that the epistle had been read incorrectly, but did not elucidate his meaning further. During the Cherubok hymn, he began to sing the words, but did not finish, and, lowering himself to his knees, let his forehead cling to the stone church floor and remained thus prostrate for a rather long time. At last, the funeral service proper began, and candles were handed out. The panic-stricken father began to fuss about it again, but the moving, stupendous funeral swinging woke and shook him and shook his soul. He somehow shrank all over suddenly and began a rapid, staccato sobbing, at first under his voice, but towards the end, loudly. And when the valediction began and the coffin was, un was covered, he embraced it with his arms, as though he would not let them cover up Ily Ilyushenka, and began rapidly and avidly, without cease, to kiss the lips of his dead boy. At last they managed to prevail on him and had already begun to lead him away from the step, when he suddenly stretched out an arm impetuously and took a few flowers from the little coffin. He looked at them, and it was as if he had a dawning on some new idea, with the result that he seemed to forget about the principal matter for a moment. Little by little he seemed to fall into a reverie, a rever reverie, or reverie. It's a word I heard before, actually. R-E-V-E-R-I-E. -E -E. I looked that up. And no longer offered any assistance when the coffin was raised up and borne outside to the little grave. It was not far away, in the cemetery, right beside the church. Expensive. It was Katerina Ivanovna who had paid for it. After the customary ritual, the grave diggers lowered the coffin. Snergeryov bent down to so low, his flowers in his hands, over the open grave that the boys clutched hold of his coat in alarm and began to haul him back. But it was as though he no longer really understood what was being accomplished. When they, began, when, they be, when they began to fill in the grave, he suddenly began to point worriedly at the falling earth and even began to say something, but no one could de decipher it, and he suddenly fell quiet on his own accord. At that point, he remained him. At that point, they reminded him that he must crumble the crust of bread, and he grew terribly agitated, whipped out the crust, and began to break it, break it in his fingers, throwing the morsels about the little grave. Now come flying, little birds, now come flying, little sparrows, he muttered worriedly. One of the boys started to observe to him that it was awkward for him to break the crust with flowers in his hands, and that he ought to let someone, someone hold them for a while. But he would not allow it, and even grew suddenly fearful for his flowers, as though they were trying to take them away from him altogether. altogether. And having taken a glance at the grave, and seemingly satisfied that all had been done, the pieces crumbled, he suddenly, he suddenly, unexpectedly, and even quite calmly, turned and strolled off home. But soon his pace grew quicker and more hurried. He was in a rush, almost running. Alyosha and the boys kept up with him. Flowers for little mother! Flowers for little mother! Little mother's been offended! He began to exclaim suddenly. Someone cried out to him, telling him to put his hat on, that it was cold now, but upon hearing this, he flung the hat on the snow, as if in malice, and began to say over and over again, I don't want my hat! I don't want my hat! The boy Smirov retrieved it, and carried it after him. Every last one of the boys was crying. Kolya and the boy who had discovered Troy, most of all, and although Smirov, the captain's hat in his hands, was also weeping dreadfully, he managed nonetheless, almost in a run, to pick up a fragment of brick that lay red on the snow of the path, in order to throw it at a swiftly passing flock of sparrows. Of course he missed his mark and continued run, weeping. When they gave, when they had gone halfway, Snegiryov suddenly came to a halt, stood for half a moment as though some, some sudden shock had overtaken him, and suddenly, turning back towards the church, set off at a run towards the little grave they had abandoned. 
The boys in an instant caught up and clutched hold of him from every side. At that point, as if in helplessness, like a man overwhelmed, he fell onto the snow and, lashing about, howling and, sob and sobbing, began to cry out, My fellow, Ilyushenka, my dear fellow! Alyosha and Kolya began to raise him up, entreating him and prevailing upon him. Captain, that will do. A man of courage has a duty to endure, Kolya mut muttered. And what about the flowers? You, you'll spoil them. And what about the flowers? You'll spoil them, Alyosha said, joining in. And little mother is expecting them. She is sitting crying because you did not give her any of Ilyushenka's flower today. Ilyusha's little bed is still there. Yes, yes, we must go to little mother, to little mother, Snegiryov remembered again, suddenly. They removed the bed, they removed the bed, he added, as though in fear that the bed might indeed be removed, leapt up again and ran off home. But it was quite near now, and they all came running together. Snegiryov impetuously opened the door and cried out to his wife, with whom he had earlier so cruelly quarreled. Little mother, little mother, dear one, Ilyushenka has sent you flowers for your bad legs, he shouted, stretching out to her, to her the little bunch of flowers, all frozen and broken from when he had lashed out, lashed about on the snow a moment earlier. But at, but at that same moment, before Ilyush, Ilyusha's little bed in the corner, he caught sight of Ilyusha's boot, boots that stood side by side, having only just been tidied up by the landlady. Old, faded, stiffened boots with patches. At the sight of them, he raised his hands and threw himself towards them, fell to his knees, knees, seized one boot and pressing his lips to it, began to kiss it avidly, crying aloud, My fellow Ilyushenka, my dear fellow, where are your little feet? What have you done with him? What have you done with him? The crazy woman began to wail in heartbreaking voice. At that point, Ninochka too began to sob. Kolya ran out of the room and, then bo and the boys began to follow him. At last, Alyosha, too, went out after them. Let them cry. Let them cry it out, he said to Kolya. It is impossible to do anything that will console them now. Let us wait for a moment and then return. Yes, it is impossible, and this is dreadful, Kolya confirmed. You know, Karamazov, he said, suddenly lowering his voice so that none should hear. I'm very sad, and if only it were possible to resurrect him, I would give everything in the world. Ah, and I too, said Alyosha. What do you suppose, Karamazov? Should we come back again this evening? I mean, you will get drunk. Perhaps we will. Only the two of us, you and I, will come. That will be enough in order to sit with them for an hour or so, with the, mo with the mother and Inachka. For if we all come at once, we'll just bring it all back to them again, Alyosha counseled. The landlady is laying the table in there for them now. It's going to be a funeral meal. Or whatever, a priest is coming. Will we go back in for that now, Karamazov, or not? Without question, said Alyosha. Strange it is all, all this Karamazov, such grief, and suddenly some kind of blindness. How unnatural everything is in our religion. They're going to have a, they're going to have salmon in there too, the boy who had discovered Troy suddenly and loudly observed. I would earnestly request you, Kartashov, not to meddle any further with your stupid remarks, particularly when you are not being spoken to, and when no one even cares whether you exist or not, Kolya retorted irritably in his direction. The boy fairly turned scarlet, but did not dare to make any reply. In the meantime, they were all quietly strolling along the path, and suddenly Smirov exclaimed, Here is Ilyusha's stone, the one under which they were going to bury him. They all came to a silent standstill, standstill beside the stone, beside the large, large stone. Alyosha looked, and the entire tableau of what Snegiryov had related once about Ilyushenka, how the latter, weeping and embracing his father, had exclaimed, Papa, dear Papa, how long he made you fall, at once presented itself to his memory. Something to quake his, within his soul, soul. With a serious and important air, he took in with his eyes all these dear, bright schoolboy faces, the faces of Ilyusha's companions, and suddenly said to them, Gentlemen, I should like to say a few words to you here, at this very spot. The boys surrounded him, surrounded him at one, and at once turned on him their fixed, expectant eyes. Gentlemen, we, sh <coughs> Gentlemen, we shall soon part. 
We shall soon be parted. I am going to be for a while yet with my two brothers, of whom one is about to go into exile, and the other is lying at the point of death. But soon I am going to leave this town, possibly for a very long time, and then, gentlemen, we shall be parted. So let us here, by Ilyusha's stone, agree that we shall never forget, in the first place, Ilyushenka, and in the second, one another. And whatever may befall us subsequently in life, even though we do not meet for twenty years hereafter, all the same let us remember how we buried the poor boy, poor boy, the one at whom you formerly threw stones, do you remember, down there by the bridge, but whom everyone came to love so later. He was a wonderful boy, a kind of brave, a kind and brave boy. He had a sense of the honor and of the bitter insult that his father bore, and for which he rose up. So in the first place, let us remember, gentlemen, all our lives. And even though we may be occupied with the most important matters, attain honors, or fall into something great, or, or fall into some great misfortune, all the same, let us not forget how good we found it here, all of us in association, united by such good and happy feeling, with which for this time of our love for the poor boy has possibly made us better than we are in actual fact. My little doves, allow me to call you little doves, for, for you resemble them very much, those pretty warm grey birds, now, at this moment, as I gaze upon your kind dear faces. My dear young children, it may be that you will not understand what I am about to say to you, because I speak very incomprehensibly, but you will nonetheless remember it, and later on, and later one day, will agree with my words. Know then that there is nothing more lofty, nor more powerful, nor more healthy, nor more useful, later on in life, than some good memory, and particularly one that has been born from childhood, from one's parents' home. Much is said to you about your education, but a beautiful, sacred memory like that, one preserved from childhood, is possibly the very best education of all. If he gathers many such mem memories in his life, a man is saved from it all. And even if only one good memory remains within our hearts, then even it may serve some day for our sal salvation. It may be that we shall later even grow wicked, have not the strength to keep ourselves from, bad, from a bad action, laugh at human tears and at those men who say, as Collier exclaimed today, I want to suffer for all men, and all those men we shall perhaps make wicked mockery. Yet nonetheless, however wicked we may be, though God keep us from it, whenever we remember how we buried Ilyusha, how we loved him in the last days, and how we spoke just now in such a friendly way, and so together by his stone, then the cruelest and most mocking one of us, if thus we shall become, will nonetheless not dare to laugh within himself at the fact that he was kind and good at this present moment. Not only that, but perhaps this very moment alone will keep him from great evil, and he will have second thoughts and say, Yes, I was good that day, bold and honest. Let him smile to him ironically. That does not matter. A man, of, a man often laughs at what is kind and good. It comes of mere frivol it comes of mere frivolity but i was uh, but i want to assure you gentlemen that when he smiles that way he will at once within his heart he will at once say within his heart no i act badly in smiling ironically for at those things one must never laugh it will definitely be like that karamazov i understand you karamazov but kolya exclaimed his eyes a flash the boys had begun to grow excited and also wanted to exclaim something, but they restrained themselves, gazing at the orator fixedly and with tender emotion. I say this for the risk that we may become bad, Alyosha resumed. But why should we become bad? Come to think of it, gentlemen. Let us, in the first place and above all, be kind and honest, and then let us never forget one another. This I repeat again. I give you my word, gentlemen, that I shall never forget a single moment of you. Each face that gaze on me now, this moment, I shall remember, even though it be for, for thirty years. Today, Kolya tried to make Kartyshov think that we did not want to know whether he exists or not, as if I could get, as if I could forget that Kart Kartyshov exists and that he does not blush any more now, as he did that day when he discovered Troy. But looks at me with those wonderful, kind, merry eyes of his, gentlemen, my dear gentlemen. Let us all be as magnanimous as bold and bold as Ilyushenka, as clever, bold, and magnanimous as Kolya, who will be far cleverer when he gets a bit older. Older, and let us be as modest, but as clever and dear as Kartashov. But why do I speak of those two? All of you, gentlemen, are dear to me from this day. All of you, I shall enclose within my heart, as I ask you to enclose me within yours. Well, and who is it 
who has united us in this kind and good emotion, one which we shall always, all our lives, remember and are resolved to remember. If not Ilyushenka, that kind boy, that dear boy, a boy who shall be precious to us until the end of all, to the end of the age, ages. Let us never forget him, and let there be for him an eternal and good memory within our hearts, from this day forth and to the end, ends of the ages. That's right, that's right, eternal, eternal, the boys shouted in their resonant voices, their, face, their faces filled, filled with tender emotion. Let us also remember his face, and his clothes, and his poor little boots, and his coffin, and his unhappy, sinful father, and how he boldly rose up alone for him against the entire class. We shall remember, we shall remember, the boys shouted again. He was brave, he was kind. Oh, how I loved him, Kolya exclaimed. Oh, young children, oh, dear friends, do not be afraid of life. How good is life when one does, when one does some good and upright thing? Yes, yes, the boys repeated in ecstasy. Karamazov, we love you, they all called up. Tears, teardrops flashed in the eyes of many. Hurrah for Karamazov, Kolya proclaimed ecstatically. And, and eternal memory to the dead boy, Alyosha added once more with emotion. Eternal memory! Karamazov, Kolya cried. Is it really true what religion says, that we shall all rise up from the dead and come to life and see one another again, and every one, even Ilyushenka? Without question we shall rise. Without question we shall come... We shall see one another and joyfully tell one another everything that ha that has happened. Half laughing, half in ecstasy, Alyosha replied. Oh, how good would that be? How good? Oh, how good that will be, burst from Kolya. Well, and now let us finish our talk and go to his fu funeral meal. Don't let it trouble you that we shall eat in this. After all, they are a thing that is ancient and eternal and good for all that too, Alyosha laughed. Well, come on, look. We shall go now hand in hand, and eternally like this, all our lives hand in hand. Hurrah for Karamazov! Kolya shouted once more in ecstasy, and once more all the boys caught up his exclamation.